Um, my name is Kristen Eggleston. I'm the EO at CRBRA and your moderator for today. Um, so the purpose of this was just to, you know, obviously we are going to be continuing to live in a Zoom world for the time being. So I uh, wanted to provide a way for people to, you know, keep getting some learning opportunities and opportunities to collaborate. Um, that's one of the best things about our members is your willingness to collaborate with each other. Um, so we put together these working lunch webinars. This is only our second one. Um, and Luke Michaels actually, you know, came to me with the idea for the Ask the Builder. So thank you, Luke. Um, and we were also able to get Frank Barbera, Barbera Holmes uh, to join us and Peter and Luke. Lindsay Belmonte from Belmonte Builders. So just want to give um, everybody a chance to, you know, introduce yourselves, um, just a tiny bit about your company. I'm pretty sure everybody on the call probably has a very good feel for who you are. Um, but if you just want to, Luke, go ahead and start and introduce yourself for everybody. Yeah, uh, Luke Michaels with Michaels Group Homes, um, based in Malta and building all over the capital region from Bethlehem to Queensbury. Awesome. Frank, how about you? Frank Barbera with Barbera Homes. We are in Latham, actually moving in a couple months around the corner and staying in the Latham area. Um, again, much like the other builders with us today, we are stretched up and down the North Way from uh, the town of New Scotland up north through Saratoga County. So single family, semi-custom. Great. And Peter, welcome. Hey. Pete Belmonte and my daughter Lindsay is here, uh, but with Belmonte Builders. We are folks primarily in on Saratoga County. We do venture into other areas, but Saratoga County is our primary focus. Great. Um, so just a couple housekeeping items. We do have everybody except our panelists and myself muted just because I'm sure you all know there tends to be a lot of background noise that comes through whether people intend for it and, or not. So um, we have a couple, you know, discussion points that we plan to cover, but we're very open to taking questions that you guys might have. So if you have a question, you can use the raise your hand icon. Uh, you can send a message to me through the chat or you can try to wave on screen, I'll look for you. Um, but we just wanna make sure we can, you know, get as much information in as we can in this 30 minute time period. We're really just trying to stick to that so that, you know, you can all get back to your busy day. Um, so just to kick it off, um, Frank, do you mind starting us off, just kind of giving an update on where you feel like the market is right now, what's going on, who's buying? The market conditions, I think, as we're all seeing, is are, are very good for buying right now. There are a lot of customers out there. We are very busy on all of our sites. And I think one of the biggest pressures that we're facing with this buyer that's out there is the affordability issue that I'm sure we'll dive into a little bit later. Um, but for the moment, we are very pleased with the way the building um, sales have, have responded from COVID. It was unexpected. I think we all got a nice surprise afterwards. I mean, it's been busy. And we are seeing people coming from out of town, downstate. We're seeing people wanting to get out of their apartments, get into a safe and secure family home environment. And that's driving a lot of our sales. Right. Peter, I feel like I've heard that you guys are uh, seeing a lot of people come up from the cities and uh, New York City, Boston. Um, are you kind of seeing that same trend with your customers? We're seeing a multitude of situations. They're certainly, we're getting our fair share of people coming up from out of the area. We're also seeing a lot of people mobile, local. So it's my suspicion that they're the ones seeing the people coming up from the South cutting them loose and now, now they're out trying to buy a new home and we're intercepting them. So we're, we're seeing a pretty even split. I can't say it's a trend one way or the other. Okay. Luke, do you have anything to add just about how you, you see the market? Um, yeah, we've had some people moving up from the cities. I wouldn't say it's, um, you know, a lot that we would, um, see it as a, as, as a new trend by any means. But I think what we have seen is some of the buyers that we're getting right now, due to lack of supply in the market right now, we get a lot of people for, from a resale standpoint. So we're getting these buyers, and Frank mentioned a little bit from the affordability standpoint, 
we're seeing these buyers come into our sites and taking lot holds, signing contracts for those base entry level numbers, which might be at the top of their budget. So by the time they get to us and they start talking about options or, you know, uh, custom options in the design room or anything like that, I, I think that's been a little limited. I think that, you know, a lot of these people are getting in at the high end of their budget um, where we're at right now. There's a lot of um, factors with that, you know, that go into that pricing. I'm sure we'll talk about that too, but um, so that's kind of what we're seeing from, uh, from new buyers. Sure. Um, are you seeing it in any community or neighborhood in particular? Is there, you know, Albany County versus Saratoga County or is it straight across the board, you know, with everybody? We're seeing sales across the board, whether it's Albany County, the colony area, Saratoga County. Yeah. Great. Um, so we've talked a little bit about affordability. Um, obviously, everybody knows that uh, supply has been a major issue. Um, NAHB reported just earlier this week that the spike in lumber prices has caused the price of an average single family home to jump by more than $24,000. Is that something, you know, they're giving the national average um, are you able to speak to what that's looking like for people here in the capital region? I can put that out to anybody. Yeah, I'd say that, you know, that's probably on par for lumber, but, you know, lumber is not the only story. There's everything else that's, you know, on top of that, whether it be windows, siding, roofing, drywall, insulation, it's, it's all going up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can look at it just from a lumber perspective, sure, but everything that we're seeing is, is, is going up right now. So you talk about a new home with the, uh, uh, you know, these material increases, I, I think it's probably north of $30,000 yeah. um, on average right now. You know, we, we try spending a fair amount of focus on understanding where pricing is going to go. And uh, our, our partners at Curtis have been very influential in giving us that information, but they're giving us consistent information across the board that all commodities are elevating, some more out of control than others. And the second thing that we need to pay attention to is what's the availability going to be? Uh, there's some products that availability is backing off and it's a little easier to get, but there's also some strong predictions that availability of products as we continue into the summer and potentially after the summer is going to be very, very limited. And their primary ingredients to the home. One example is sheetrock. Sheetrock currently is an allocation, which it is most of the time, but it's predictions are it's even going to get worse than we're presently experiencing. I know I heard a lot about windows in the last couple of months and long delays with those. Is there anything else that, you know, jumps out at you guys as something that has been particularly challenging? Yeah, when it comes to the products, I mean, to the supply chain issue of getting products, trusses, eight to 10 weeks uh, are, are common. Windows are way out there. Interior doors was the latest thing. If you don't plan ahead for interior doors, they went on into allocation. Now uh, we've received notice about shingles, again, going into severe allocation. So now we're looking at backup manufacturers and supply for shingles. Uh, tubs, which are very popular now, eight to 10 weeks easily, if you're gonna order a tub. Uh, so yes, there's a lot of products that even before we commit to selling them, we will check with our suppliers to make sure we can even get them. So that's, that's really just added another step to the process is trying to lock some of these products in. Right. How are the customers responding when you're trying to explain, you know, this to them? You, the lumber is getting the bulk of the story. Um, and that's for those of us who have, you know, an interest and are paying attention. What mm -hmm. are you hearing from your customers when you're trying to explain this as they're looking to you with their process for timeline? Yeah, that's, you know, <laughs> they understand until they don't, yeah. um, you know, nice <laughs> yeah. fair enough. Um, so and they under also understand why it's the case for everybody else, just not for them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of our uh, associate members sent in a question beforehand um, that kind of speaks to this issue saying, um, 
you know, your needs as um, a builder, what you're looking for from your suppliers. Um, he wants to make sure that, you know, they're keeping up with the high expectations that um, you guys have. Has there been anything that has changed for you in your company policies or procedures, you know, since COVID resulting from COVID? Um, is there anything that suppliers should be, you know, thinking about, should know about? And in addition to that, is there um, anything that suppliers have done that have made a huge difference for you or others without naming names who have, you know, missed the mark and maybe could help these other guys learn from? I think communication is the key. I mean, you know, when we see, you know, contracts coming in, I think we are uh, more than ever getting out in front of them and identifying, like Peter was talking about, availability. Um, identifying, getting orders in as soon as possible, um, and, you know, vice versa, you know, we need to be com good communicators, and same with our suppliers back to us, so we can make sure we're ahead of the game on everything. I mean, um, there's, you know, there's delays in construction all across the board, whether it be these material delays or the increases, it's just, um, you know, that, that communication is key, so it, it takes more of it, and, you know, none of us are seeing each other as often anymore, um, so, um, you know, that, I think that's, that's what it comes down to more communication up front early, earlier, the better, more often, the better. And I think, what, uh, go ahead, Peter. No, I think Luke hit, hit on it is, uh, we're spending a lot of time emphasizing, you got to talk to one another, not only internally, but to our suppliers to give them fair warning of what's going on. We haven't had many suppliers that have pushed back to the up in volume. We have had some that haven't been able to handle it, but if you give them enough fair warning, they'll be prepared when you get there. So you, you gotta be talking to them. And we're doing the same. We're putting out our purchase orders as early in the process as we possibly can. Not that that's making a lot of difference because a lot of the suppliers just can't get inventory. You know, it'll help them to know it's coming, but you know they can't stockpile for us because it's just not there to stockpile. So, you know, we still run into delays out there. Right. Um, and and I will say they've all been very good about telling us where they're at. You know, with their lead times, with their inventories. You know what we can and what we should and shouldn't order. That's great. Uh, I'm going to switch tracks a little bit. Um, when you guys are looking to open up a new site, is there something, you know, decision-making process? What goes into that? How do you decide? Is it location? Is it, what is it? What's the, the magic there? I think there's a number of factors. Um, you know, obviously location is always key, but, you know, at the end of the day, you put yourself in a new home buyer shoes, right? You know, what are new home buyers looking for? low taxes, great school district, convenience, all those things. So if you put yourself in the, you know, future buyer shoes and, you know, can you picture yourself living there? That would be, you know, the, the, the first test. And then from there, you know, it's, um, you know, the towns you're working in, um, you know, the feasibility of the sites, obviously. Um, I'd say that was the, that'd be the first thing is kind of, you know, the conveniences, schools, taxes, Know, utilities, things like that. Yeah, Lou's got a really interesting approach. He goes to the town that's the most difficult to get an approval from. <laughs> Frank and he knows I'll have no competition. Yeah. <laughs> Luke's going to be there. We don't want to be there. We know what it's going to be like. <laughs> Good old Bethlehem. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. They've been a problem ever since day one. Yeah. Yeah. But I'd say some of the projects, you know, we take a very detailed approach to them and we'll look into the numbers and do our market research and then others are opportunistic we know the local market if something comes up and you know you feel good about it you won't take as analytical of approach you will just go after that piece so you know it, there's two ways to approach and at least that's how what happens here um, yeah, we're all building in strong markets so it's more a matter of aligning our product to what the market appreciates. Uh, each, each community is not looking for the same thing, even that there could be similarities, but they're looking for different price points, different magnitude of products. So 
you know, we, we've got the, the areas nailed down well. Now it's just a matter of lining our product with the market wants. Right. Uh, Peter, what communities and neighborhoods do you guys have coming up that you know think might be of interest to people? Uh, our, the next community that we'll be opening up will be later this year. It's going to be called Forest Grove. It's in the town of Wilton, uh, just immediately outside of Saratoga. It will be a large community that will give us a lot of longevity for several years to come. It's going to have a full variety of products ranging from duplexes on up to single luxury single family homes and they'll all be available at different times in the life cycle of the community so that's going to be our most recent uh, we've got a few projects on the drawing board going forward which will come out in 22 and 23 forest grove is what our focus is on right now excellent how about you frank anything new and um, exciting we have a few that'll open this year. We have a condo project in Clifton Park coming up uh, right behind um, land that was once Peter's. So <laughs> it'll be a nice project um, right at, um, what's the, uh, I just drew a blank. What's the restaurant there? Ravenswood. Ravenswood. Right behind the Ravenswood. Thank you. And then uh, another 40 lot subdivision on Albany, Shaker Road and Colony. Those are our two big ones to open this year and some small lots up in the city of Saratoga. Have you sold so, out Steepleview? Steepleview, no, we still have a few more to go in there. So nice. That one. But that's been a nice project, a nice change of pace. Yeah. As a Sienna grad, I love the location. Yeah, can't be <laughs> beat there, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Luke, how about you? Um. We're currently um, developing um, some property in Clifton Park off exit eight, and uh, that'll be open, you know, late spring, early summer for sales. It'll be um, conventional single family homes. Um, that'll be called Crescent Woods. And then after that, later this summer, we'll begin developing uh, a townhouse community in Malta. Um, that'll be uh, a maintenance free townhouse community. So. Those will hopefully all be online this year. So that's what's in front of us right now. That's awesome. So I got a question back that I threw the chat that I didn't see when we were talking about affordability before. So um, one of our associates is wondering what price point do home, um, of homes do you think will be the price where demand slows? $1 million. <laughs> Uh, the follow-up to that is how uh, much more in cost can you pass along to the customers on the pricing front? How close are you hitting? How close are you to hitting the ceiling of what they're willing to pay for? I think we're how very lower close. Interest rates gonna go. <laughs> What's that? How lower interest rates gonna go? Yeah, and, and that's the really that's the only thing. Go ahead, yeah. No, it's really a trade-off. It's uh, I think the the market has accepted the past year's price increases gracefully because interest rates have been so low. But when the interest rates start to tick up, I think we're all gonna be in the pucker mode. Yeah. yeah, and I agree with Peter's assessment. I mean, that's exactly what our biggest fear is. We have definitely hit the ceiling on some of our projects. You know, I'm choking with some of the price increases we're passing along this month. We calculated $4,600 in hard costs per unit since Jan 1 have come across our desk. And, you know, we're hitting the ceiling in this $400,000 buyer range. I mean, these people that want to be low fours are pushing fives. And that's one of the markets that you know, makes me nervous with an uptick in rates, you know, and is, rates need to stay low in order for people to afford what we're selling right now. Yeah, I certainly agree with both Peter and Frank on, I think we're, if, you know, we, we are approaching there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have, you know, a lot of people who are getting in at our um, at our get in rates in some of these new home communities. And, um, you know, after some price increases that we've had to pass on and um, they are being very limited in the next step of color selection and customization. So, you know, if we have to pass on further price increases, you know, now we're going to be starting to drive that person, you know, out of the market. Right. And we're seeing it. We're seeing people, 
backing up. You know, we are losing deals to affordability. They can't get what they want and they're getting frustrated. So we are, we are seeing that. And I'm sure nobody's bottom line has improved with all these price increases. No. That's the other thing. This is just, you know, keeping us afloat. Right. There's, there's no profit in it. Did you go into COVID prepared with escalation clauses just as a matter of business um, out of curiosity? Or is it something that you've had to, you know, work through? No, we, we don't have any escalation clauses and don't plan to at this point. No, and a lot of the members of my Build a 20 group have tried escalation clauses and there's been revolts in their markets. Really? You know, whether it's from the real estate community or the consumers. Um, I don't know how we pull that off. I've read several of them. They're pretty daunting. Yeah, yeah it's a great theory. Certainly would protect us against the price increases we're experiencing. But like uh, Luke is saying, he's seeing people come into the market coming in and buying a unit that is their maximum affordability. And then you're going to throw a variable on top of it that they don't really know what the final price is going to be. It just doesn't sit well. We've attempted them in the past. We've never been successful with them. Uh, so the day we sell it, that number's locked. Yeah. Wow. And if you had, and the interesting thing is if you had it in there, say all of a sudden, you know, if you're, if you're a buyer, if prices come down, I expect you to change your price. Right. You know, when people are going to be you know, waking up every morning, like looking at the stock market, seeing where lumber's at, seeing if they can their price their house. <laughs> you know? Imagine that getting that phone call every week. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Doug doesn't call you to tell you your rates going down and on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, as we were talking about this, one of our uh, mortgage lender members who's on the uh, call today said, not sure rates will go much lower, but we'll do our best to keep them as low as the economy yeah. will allow. So as to be expected here. Um, we did get another question. Um, what is a trendy thing that's attracting the most attention um, for current home buyers? What's a trendy item that's attracting? I think a trendy buyers? feature. Is there any trendy, new trendy feature? For a while it was like the soaker tubs. Mm, my reaction is I don't, I can't think of one that's coming to the surface. Yeah, and prepping for this and looking through everything that came out of the Home Builders show this, you know, last week, there wasn't anything super hot and trendy. I mean, black windows are still popular. Freestanding tubs are, you know, popular. We're selling a lot of those. And the ever exciting luxury vinyl tile taking over <laughs> for hardwood. So, right. uh, Lindsay, you seeing anything in the design centers? No, I think everything, I mean, black plumbing fixtures, the black windows. Um, we're still doing the engineered hardwood flooring, but some of those have become issues based on availability. Yeah. Mm. Same countertops. Yeah, no real sizzle this year. Yeah. That we've seen. Watching the videos that we did for the Best in Building Awards, it seems like gold accents were um, a pretty big hit for people. Um, and then, you know, just adding the warmth of wood to, you know, the stark white kitchens. Yeah, and congratulations to all the winners of those awards. There were some very creative ideas amongst uh, that full array of awards. So congratulations. That's great. Thanks, Peter, for sharing that. Um, you know, those videos are available on our website, so I've got to plug that while I'm here. Um, as Actually, I will say one thing as far as trends, because I see Michelle's on the call. Closets... Um, with people being at home, we're selling a lot more luxury closets than we have in the past. Um, some of these items for, you know, people that are in their houses all the time, so. Are you seeing people wanting, you know, a more dedicated office space? I think that was something that, uh, you know, I would think had gone away for a while there. Saw it come up in a meme over the weekends that people used to have a room that they called their computer room. Um, but now it seems, you know, everybody's working from home. Is that something that more people are asking for is that really dedicated office space? I think the, the term is Zoom room. 
<laughs> I haven't heard that. Thanks, Luke. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, personally, I think we've had that incorporated in a lot of our plans for a long time now. And, you know, it's just a matter of people recognizing it. So. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I, I haven't seen any change in that because we've already had it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Frank, didn't you guys have a project where you added a second office for somebody? I mean, we get, yes, we're getting a lot of that, you know, whether it's converting a room or adding space for people, that's certainly, and they don't need it necessarily big, like the big formal study, but yeah, a lot of his and her stuff going on right now with everybody in the house and wanting their own space. Sure. We see a lot of people uh, wanting to finish basements that is, uh, we didn't see it as much before as we are right now. Peter, are they doing them with you or prepping and doing them after they close? Both. Almost everybody preps in some form. Yeah. But we're getting a fair number of people actually finishing them. Yeah, we're seeing that same trend. So as we get down to our last couple of minutes here, um, looking out five or 10 years, uh, is there anything that you know you, you have in your, the crystal ball that you want to share. I know if we had asked this question around this time last year, nobody would have been able to actually give an accurate answer. But doing your best, is there something that you know you can share with us? I, I th there's a number of them, but one that comes to mind is you know New York's push for electric electric. Electrification, if I can say that right. Um, so what that means is no more gas extensions. And, you know, you just think about it, you know, where we are in the Northeast, you know, a home without natural gas, you know. So, you know, even the, you know, conveniences of a natural gas fireplace um, and obviously um, heating and um, hot water heaters, you know. So that's, you know, that's that's going to be interesting. That That's going to present a lot of challenges because then you're, you know, a new home, sure, it's going to be energy efficient. You know, it's, it's going to have check all those boxes, but is a new home going to be as comfortable as, you know, a resale from 10 years ago? You know, that's, that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Building on what Luke just said, personally, I'm less concerned about the comfort of it. I'm more concerned about the cost of it because all these alternatives are coming with price tags to resolve the issue. And uh, you take that along with the push from the codes department on their changing codes, the ever never ending conversation about sprinkler systems. Uh, there's some big cost hurdles that are in front of us if some of these agencies are successful in getting their way, which isn't gonna help affordability. All right. And that's the same trend that we're seeing, affordability, um, without a doubt. It's, you know, we're hyper aware of it right now, but even in a normal environment with the changes that are coming, and like Peter said, if that sprinkler mandate ever goes through, it's gonna be next to impossible to build something cost-effective. And the way we build will have to evolve and change to accommodate that. What that looks like, I don't know. Is it panelized housing? I don't know. I mean. It's a nice way to go, but something's got to give. I, but I don't know what that is yet. So. Um, Doug Ford has his hand raised here, so I'm going to unmute you, Doug. You there? Just a quick point that hasn't come up, and that's the labor shortage. That's um, having a significant impact on the, the cost of building. And, you know, even on our, on our end, on the supply side, finding <clears throat> affordable help or just finding help uh, is a challenge. So I only, I can see this getting dramatically worse as we move forward um, the next few years. Yeah, I think it may not, you know, probably the only reason it didn't come up is we were struggling with that pre-COVID as well. Uh, trying to find more and more good help, subcontractors, young, you know, younger people coming into the industry. Uh, I think we all have been fortunate to have our core group, but you always need to keep adding to that. Uh, it's been tough. 
Were you guys finding the same thing? We lost some people who retired when COVID hit. Um, you know, they just said, that's it. <laughs> They're done. It's a couple of framers, you know? So, so yeah, it's definitely been a challenge. Yeah, there's no question that uh, labor is a challenge. Doug points it out well. It's not only finding the human body, it's finding it in a form that you can afford. Uh, just adds to the adds to the pile of challenges. Yeah, we've been hearing a lot about the workforce, not just you know our builder members, our suppliers. Um, just yesterday, I had somebody reach out, you know, asking if I knew anybody looking. Um, Dee Dee and I have talked about it, and she's nodding her head down there a number of times that you know we're hearing it from everybody. Um, so you know, it's an ongoing issue. Our workforce development committee is you know getting reactivated this year, so it is going to be something that uh, we you know try to focus on at CRBRA, uh, one of Paul Papino's presidential uh, priorities here. So um, we have you know some ideas in the works to try to help with that, but you know it goes into the pile of all of the different issues we're trying to help you guys address. If you're, I don't know if you're able to watch a replay of it, but um, for the Builder Show, Mike Rowe had a presentation on there and a lot of it was um, about workforce development, which is, you know, um, which he's a big part of. And uh, he had some interesting thoughts on that um, in that presentation, um, you know, starting by changing the narrative, you know, when kids are in school um, and who knows, you know, it, it, who knows when this all shakes out, you know, in a couple of years, maybe COVID has a silver lining to that, you know, down the road. Who, I, I don't know, but that would be, that'd be something that could, that could come out of it. So might be a long shot, but. <laughs> we'll, we'll hope for it. Yeah. We have fulfilled our, you know, 30 minutes here um, with some great conversation. Thank you, Luke, Frank, Peter, Lindsay, um, and everybody who attended. You know, this has been a great showing for something that is new for us to try. So um, we did record it and I'll be adding it to the website, you know, later today for anybody who missed it or if you want to share it with anyone else in your organization. Um, but thank you guys so much. And if you have any um, topics for something you'd like to see us do in the future, um, definitely feel free to shoot me an email. So mm -hmm. thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you all for showing up. Bye. Guys. Bye. Bye.